to introduce David Garcelon, who is the president of the Institute for Wildlife Studies at Arcata. Dave has dedicated his life to the conservation of wild animals. He is one of the original founders of the Humboldt Wildlife Care Center. And in 1979, while he was still an undergraduate at Humboldt State University, he founded the Institute for Wildlife Studies so that he could start a program to reintroduce bald eagles to the Channel Islands where they were in decline due to DDT. Three decades later, Dave's organization has been instrumental in the recovery of the bald eagle on the Channel Islands, as well as instrumental in the continued efforts to recover other rare species such as the island fox, the loggerhead shrike, the desert tortoise, wolverines, and many, many more. But tonight, Dave is here to tell us the story of the species that started it all in his talk, Bringing Eagles Home, the Effort to Restore Bald Eagles to the Channel Islands. Well, thank you, Chris, and everyone. I appreciate you taking the time this evening to come and, uh, and hear this talk. Um, as a researcher, I spend a lot of time giving presentations at professional meetings and have a lot of uh, graphs and, and uh, tables and statistics and things like that. And it's really fun to be able to yank all that stuff out of this slide and be able to this program and give just a sort of a, a message on the journey that I went through with this program. And I started it as a wee child, you know, I like to say I was only about seven, but because uh, uh, when I think about the fact that I've been doing this for 35 years, it really makes me feel old. <laughs> but uh, it, it is something that uh, uh, it's kind of a journey and an adventure and, uh, and hopefully will be a little bit inspiring to you uh, when you see what can be accomplished if you, uh, if you persevere. So the bald eagle is one of two eagle species in uh, North America. Uh, the bald, the other is the golden eagle. They have, they used to occur in all 50 states, not nested in 50 states. They have a wingspan of six to seven feet and range in weight from about eight to 12 pounds. The females are larger than the males, uh, sometimes considerably larger. And uh, they nest uh, almost always near bodies of water, whether it be lakes or rivers, uh, along the bays or along uh, the coasts. Now, bald eagles are monogamous, meaning that they basically, you know, they generally have one mate for life. But we have seen that that isn't necessarily always true. Sometimes they'll have uh, breakups in relationships, and you can, you can figure that out when you have all the birds marked. Uh, but typically, they are they are uh, very habitual with their mate. And uh, but what you'll find is during the winter time, sometimes they'll come in and congregate. You know, they're not nesting anymore. They aren't defending their territory, and so they'll they'll migrate to areas where there may be abundant food sources like spawning salmon or something like that. And so that, that's a situation where you'll, you may see lots and lots of bald eagles, both adults like these birds are, and immatures and sub-adults all together in one place. Historically, as I said, bald eagles occurred across uh, the United States and uh, Canada and into northern Mexico. Uh, in Southern California, where I'll be talking about today, they uh, occurred both along the coast uh, in the Los Angeles area and Ventura on down and on all eight of the California Channel Islands. Now, probably starting just early in the 20th century, they disappeared from the, the mainland coast. I can you can probably imagine why. Lots and lots of people moving in there and, and habitat loss and uh, it was just probably pretty tough for them to maintain an existence there. But we also lost them by through the 1950s, and I think the last known nesting on the Channel Islands was in 1960. And this used to be pretty much a stronghold for bald eagles in Southern California. There were somewhere between 24 to 40 pairs of eagles that nested on the eight Channel Islands. Now the reason for the disappearance isn't well understood because no one is really paying attention at the time. It's not like somebody was involved in doing a long-term study in the bald eagles and then they started saying, oh, we're seeing fewer and fewer and then they disappeared. It's just like they were there and then there were less of them and then finally they were gone. 
And there were certainly some things that occurred. Uh, you know, the ranchers took some eagles, you know, especially young bald eagles look a lot like golden eagles. Golden eagles are certainly known to take lambs and things like that. So sheep ranchers get a little protective and will sometimes uh, start taking bald eagles as well as golden eagles. But there was also egg collecting was a very big thing. Uh, and so people used to go out and try to collect eggs from all sorts of different species and bald eagles was certainly a big one to get because uh, it's a big egg. And so they, they I know a couple different years, all known nests on, uh, uh, on Santa Cruz Island were taken by egg collectors. Oh my gosh. Uh, but what we really think was a larger factor in the disappearance of the birds there is also something that was occurring with other species and in North America at the same time. It was a, the big impact on reproduction of brown pelicans, the species here on the left. They just basically stopped reproducing. Their eggs were broken in their nests, and productivity went close to zero. Peregrine falcons across, the, uh, uh, across North America were also uh, being affected. Their, their production was going down, and they were just basically disappearing. And the biggest culprit, we think, is probably the introduction of DDT in the environment. Now, DDT, probably most of you have heard about it. It was an a insecticide used for quite a long period of time. And uh, it was used by ranchers and farmers, by public health people to control insects. And one of the big ones, I mean, DDT gets a very bad rap, but it was, it was just considered the miracle thing at the time because it was very, very effective on dealing with insects. And uh, if you get in a situation where you're in a place where people are dying of malaria, you definitely did not think DDT was bad because it was knocking back the mosquitoes and, and giving you a greater chance. But we do know that DDT was you know, widely used around not only the US, but around the world, and was later found to be associated with uh, the disappearance of some of these uh, bird species, especially the you know the raptors and some of the seabirds, uh, because of uh, eggshell thinning that uh, basically resulted in the eggs collapsing under the incubating birds or uh, losing so much water that the embryos die. And uh, one of the things that it's just kind of an interesting little clip here that was uh, made probably back in the 40s showing me, hopefully, come on. <laughs> well, maybe not. Uh, anyway, it basically showed uh, DDE being sprayed not only from airplanes, being sprayed into the hair of students, being sprayed along streets with kids playing and things like that on the street. Because the idea was it was just thinking, this is really great, we just need to get it out there, and it's going to take care of all our insect problems. Well, DDE was finally, uh, and I, 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 excuse me, I may say both DDE and DDT. DD, DDT, when it's put into the environment, breaks down pretty quickly into another compound called DDE. And DDE is the thing that, that affects the bird's ability to uh, lay good eggs. Uh, but DDT is the insecticide that is, that is sprayed out. So anyway, with the basically the ban of uh, DDT in 1972, um, we started to see the recovery of pelican paw populations. And uh, the interesting thing is DDT was not banned because of its impact on birds at all. It was banned because they started detecting it in mother's milk. And so they said, yeah, we can't be having that. So they just they got rid of it. Uh, now, even though on the Channel Islands, you know, we, lost, we had lost the, the birds out there, the nesting habitat for the eagles was still present. I mean, it's not like spraying DDT or having it in the environment destroyed all the nesting sites and killed all the, all the prey that they depend on. It was just the birds themselves. So a little bit of history. Uh, I was involved um, back in the uh, mid-1970s in doing some rehabilitation work, rep rehabilitation in, uh, in Central California. And we had some bald eagles that, we had, that had spent most of their life in captivity. And because of that, we had done some training, but we were looking for some out of the way, really, you know, 
place we could let them go where they wouldn't have much interaction with people and they could kind of ease back into being in the wild again. And so we picked San Clemente Island, which is one of the Channel Islands, to uh, release the birds. And I did this for two or three years, we released some different birds out there. And finally, when I was writing up the reports on this, I looked into the history of bald eagles on the Channel Islands and thought, man, there was really a lot of birds out here. And But DDT's gone, so why not bring the eagles back? Why not see if we can get them reestablished? And so I decided, you know, it'd be really cool and we should, I should pursue this. Well, that's a little easier said than done. So basically, it was one of them getting permits. It's like, yeah, fine. I'm 24 years old. And there's not a whole lot of uh, federal agents, agencies that are going to say, OK, yeah, fine. Here's a permit, young man, to handle endangered species and do all this stuff. And so th that was a, a two-year process in itself just to get the permits to be able to do it. The other thing was getting the money to do it. I initially thought I was going to run this program through Humboldt State. I was a student there. I thought this was going to be great. Well, again, I mean, even the, even the university was saying, like, you're a nice kid. But, uh, you know, we are not going to get involved in doing something that's never been done before and take on the responsibility and just kind of please go away. Well, I was not going to be deterred. So I set up my own institute, the Institute for Wildlife Studies, to be able to receive grant money because I wanted to be a nonprofit, so foundations or individuals that wanted to give me money could write it off their taxes. Uh, the next thing was getting the birds. Also not so easy because I really couldn't get them from California very easy initially because we didn't have very many. So I was going looking at Washington, Canada, Alaska, other places to go and get birds that had populations that were more healthy that we could in turn then get and bring down here. Uh, and finally I just had to get busy. Okay. get it going. So when you want to try to reintroduce something like a raptor back in the new area, and this is something that had been done with peregrine falcons fairly extensively, is you, is you bring birds that uh, have not fledged yet, have not started to fly, and you put them in the new location on something that is called a hack block box or a hack platform. And this is basically an artificial nest or artificial situation for the birds to grow up in and Typically, the place where the bird learns how to fly and goes out, that's what they call home. So that's when you want to have them in their new area. You can't very easily take adult birds, bring them down and say, okay, repopulate. They're going to go, see ya, and take back off again. So this was a, this was what we had to do, was kind of set up these platforms. Of course, we only use the OSHA approved one foot on the top of the step ladder. <laughs> Somehow we did a new guy. You, uh, you build a, uh, a platform, we have bars all the way around the front so the birds could look out, become familiar with their surroundings. We had a video camera so we could monitor them from, uh, from a blind we had set up. The back side of this was actually a blind that we could walk up the ladder and get inside and watch the birds through one-way glass so we could see how they were behaving. We could introduce food to them through shoots at night so they wouldn't associate being fed by humans. We just wanted to keep human interaction at a minimum. And then this, this was what we call the fledging door. This is something that we could lower down when the birds were ready to be released. And we did it at night. We could do it from behind the platform so again, they wouldn't, be, they, they wouldn't know what was going on and uh, uh, maybe more cash for a release. The next thing, we had to build a nest that we could put them in, and you know that in itself is a lot of work. It's hard to put those sticks in your mouth and weed them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of tough to do that, but get that done. And then, and then we have a branch over here that they can jump to once they get coordinated enough to do that. And then, as you can see, they have a good view of looking out. Um, all right. The next thing to do was basically find the birds. So once we got permission, saying like, okay, the Forest Service said you can come onto our land in Washington and you can collect these birds. What we were looking for as nests that had at least two chicks, and bald eagles will have from one to three, but one or two is the most common. Uh, and we, because we didn't, we wanted to take one bird, but always make sure we were leaving one chick for the adults to continue to raise. So you do a lot of flying, flying around and uh, uh, trying to uh, locate nests and, and then once you, once you find them, then the trick is to get on the ground and find them. And as you can imagine, some of these dense forests, that was somewhat challenging as well. Um, here's uh, 
Jim Campbell Spickler is in the audience and he's walking to us understory while we're trying to figure out where the nest is that we saw from the air. And here's Jim again. He just shoots one of those birds right out of the nest. He's really good. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, shoots a line up in a tree and then pulls up a climbing rope and then does his little monkey thing where he goes up the, up the tree and uh, gets in the nest. And this is what we find there. So these are these little rascals. These birds are about seven or eight weeks old right there. And, uh, you know, they're acting all tough and, you know, uh, clacking at him and making noises and this and that. And But, you know, in reality, they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Just, it's not really too much you have to be afraid of them. Uh, they, can still, they can still hurt you with their feet, so you don't want to be, use some care with them. And mostly, when we're pulling them out of the nest, we're just trying to make sure we don't hurt them. And we also want to be nice and casual when we're trying to get them out, ease in very slowly. You know, when Jim does a sport, it's a lot of talking to them and letting them just kind of get used to the fact that you're there and, and then reach and snag them and be able to take them out. And so we lower them back down out of the tree and then we have our, <laughs> ourselves a little bird. So uh, to them, as far as they know, this is how life is supposed to be. Okay, let's see, I'm seven weeks old, it's time to <laughs> pull out of the nest and go for a ride. Uh, and this, this is a process. If you're going up to some remote place like Alaska or into Washington and some of the, the offshore islands, you know, we sometimes bring out uh, a larger boat, go around, collect all the birds. These are all the, the flight cages that we got to put them in, or the, the flight carriers so that we could put them in there and then put them directly on a, uh, on a, a jet cargo plane to send them back down to California. Once we got down on the island, then we put them up on the platforms, usually two or three birds per nest, just like they would normally have in the wild. And of course, these birds had never been together before. These aren't, we don't take them out of the same nest. So there's a certain amount of deciding who's going to be in charge and, you know, flopping at each other and pecking each other and all that. And finally, they get it all worked out. And uh, as you can see, some of the, these are fish and things that we introduced into the nest for them to be able to feed on. We, all, we get them at an age that's seven or eight weeks old. They're just starting to become more aware of their surroundings, you know, spending more time looking around. And they are able to feed themselves. And that's a big deal because we didn't want to have to feed them because that was going to make it difficult for us to be able to separate ourselves from the birds and have them potentially become imprint. So they do a lot. It's just comical to watch these guys grow up. I mean, it is just, you know, again, they're just, they mostly poop and eat and stand there and grow feathers. And, and finally, they start moving around in the nest more, you know. And there's that perch out there we're showing you. And so they're standing on the nest, and the perch is about a foot and a half away. But it's just like, it might as well be in Chicago as far as they're concerned. Just look over at it and go, wow, man, to be there, that would be so cool. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually, you know, they do a lot of flapping, and they decide that they're going to just, man, make that big leap over and land on the branch. And I saw one do that one time, and he's standing there, you know, looking around like, I'm cool. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like he's looking back at the nest and going like, uh, how do I know? And he's looking at his feet, looking back at the nest and going, and he brings one foot over, stands on the other, falls over. <laughs> it, just, it just takes him a while to figure out how to do all of the stuff. So basically, after they're on the nest for about four to five weeks, and we try to let them go at the same time that they would normally be fledging out of a nest in the wild. And we can typically see this because of the fact that they're, they're starting to basically hover above the nest. They can sit there and flap their wings and hover up above and come back down again. They can easily go back and forth. And another kind of biggie is they start spending the night on the perch. So they don't come back to the nest and lie down. They spend the night uh, perched up on the branch because we don't want them lying down on the ground to sleep after they go out of the wild. So one night, uh, uh, we'll go come in before, before light, lower this door, and then uh, the birds are free to come out as they want. Sometimes we get one that jumps out there right away, the other one's going, I'm not even going to look at that. <laughs> Way too spooky, I'm just going to stay inside here. Um, and uh, they'll sit out there and do a lot of jumping up and down and flapping. And, and sometimes they're quick, some birds were quick to leave, other ones were like, yeah, maybe tomorrow. You know, and so they spend, they may roost out there and spend some time there, but it's like it doesn't matter to us. There's food inside and they can, 
you know, they can go as they want. Uh, the only problem is when a bird spends five days out there, well then we run out of food inside and we have to try to sneak in and put more food in there and not accidentally flush them off the, uh, off the fledging board. So after they fly, um, again, this, we're sort of the surrogate moms and dads, where they still depend on us for food. So we continue to put food in on the nest in here, and they use this as sort of home base. They're flying around, making you know, short flights, and coming back, landing on top of the platform, jump down the door, go in. Sometimes they'll still spend the night inside again. Other times they'll spend the night up on top. Um, sometimes they'll go, you know, they'll, they'll roost in a tree. And everything is new to them. And so it's just trying to make, figure out how everything works. They're flying up. They go to land on the very top of a tree. And, and it's just like a pinball thing. They just go down through the tree because there's nothing to support them. And finally they go like, oh yeah, it has to be bigger than this. <laughs> and, and just all you're doing is hoping, don't break a wing while you're trying to figure all this out. So uh, we also end up putting food down on the ground so they get used to feeding on carcasses. And, we keep, and then we slowly we start moving the carcasses around in different places on the island so they start to learn that it's not always going to be in the same place. Food isn't always just here. You have to go and look for it. And the other thing is they start queuing in on ravens because ravens find the food really fast. So now they start flying around looking for groups of ravens to come in. And then they can, just, they can run the ravens off and, uh, and eat the food. But you can see we've got these juvenile birds here. And as I said, it takes a while for these things to mature. So when I started this program, it's just this long wait. I just, so many times, I said, why didn't I work on sparrows? <laughs> reading the next year, you know? So I just had to sit and just start the clock going, you know, say, okay, well, let's just see what happens. And sure enough, you know, it's just, as time goes by, you know, you start to see the mature feathers coming in. These are birds that are, they still, have, this bird still has a little bit of dark. It's probably a, probably a four-year-old. And uh, um, so they're, they're maturing. And at this point, they start actually pairing up. And even though they may not be ready to breed yet, they're forming these pair bonds and uh, are, are starting to get uh, uh, ready to, to nest. Now, at the same time, they've improved over these years their, their hunting skills, which are going to be certainly necessary to be able to raise a family. Uh, the, the, Fishing thing, you know, even though they're renowned fishermen, that does not come the first try. That usually if you see a whole lot of striking the water, nothing, striking the water, nothing. You know, grabbing leaves and carrying them around. Hey, I got one. <laughs> Good job. And, uh, you know, they'll fly and pick up sticks off the ground and just start, you know, they're practicing trying to get the whole coordination thing down. But eventually they do. It usually takes them about a year before they're, they're getting reasonably good at catching fish. But then they'll also, uh, uh, catch birds, and uh, so these are these are important skills that they've had to develop over this over this uh, uh, maturation period. And finally, man, it's like four, 1984, four years into it, the earliest we would expect them to actually nest, I saw birds building a nest. I thought I was going to go crazy. I just could not sit still. I watched them for like an hour. I had to run down the Avalon and tell everybody I'd run back again, watch some more. And they were coming back and forth and bringing sticks in. It was just, I just couldn't believe it. It was actually going to work. And so finally, you know, a uh, um, few weeks into this, I see the birds in incubating posture. I'm like, yes, here we go. You know, and so now it's like, okay, it's 33 days. So like, Start now, then that will be, and they were on the nest for two or three days, and then they are gone. They weren't incubating anymore. And so I snuck in there and looked, and I didn't see anything in the nest. And so one of my professors at Humboldt said, well, you know, sometimes these long-lived raptors and stuff, they have, they, they practice one year. They may have built the nest, you know, got in there, tried it out, and said, like, looked at each other and said, hey, you know what you're supposed to do? No, do you? No, okay. <laughs> So uh, it's kind of like you don't necessarily have it all wired the first time around. So I'm like, okay, well that made me feel a little bit better, you know. I was, uh, that was okay. And so, you know, the uh, next year we had another nest. This time we saw eggs in there. I'm like, okay, here we go now. And uh, and I had pretty much the same thing. I had birds on the nest for a week or ten days, and then all of a sudden they were gone. And I went to the nest that time and looked, and there were eggshell birds. 
Now, part of that, well, you know, they also, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, maybe they just, you know, dove on the nest, you know, to incubate and didn't really, you know, weren't moving in slowly or the male stepped on it because he was a klutz or something or other. But, you know, we sent the fragments in for analysis anyway. So uh, we just want to know, I mean, we certainly want to know what's going on here. And that's when I got some really bad news. And that was that the residue, oak residue that they could get off some of these eggshell fragments showed that there were high concentrations of PDE in these eggs. I was pretty devastated because uh, this was not part of the plan. You know, I mean, that just really couldn't understand how can this be happening? I mean, DDT is not DDT is not being used anymore. It hasn't been used in, you know, 10 years, 12 years at that time. The brown pelican, I mean, they're laying eggs like crazy. I mean, everything was going fine. They aren't having any problems. Uh, bald eagles in other areas of the U.S. were starting to reproduce normally. And uh, I just confused. <laughs> Then six years into the program, we find out the following. Montrose Chemical Corporation, which manufactured DET and Torrance, dumped it through a sewage outfall for a number of years into the ocean. Uh, various chemical companies down there also discharged PCBs through the municipal sewer. And an estimated 100 tons of DET was discharged uh, into the ocean, uh, along with 11 tons of PCBs. Now, the uh, outfall there is about seven miles offshore, but there's a shelf there and then a big drop off, and this is where they basically mapped out, it was 1,800 tons of uh, sludge, which they thought contained 100 tons of DDT. And uh, there was an additional 500 tons that was taken out into the middle of the channel in drums, and they would bust the drums open with fire axes so they'd make sure they would sink. But in looking at the concentrations of DDE in the fish around the islands, we were still a little perplexed. You know, we, this analysis, and like, well, it's not that high. I mean, what what is the problem? I mean, we kept thinking, well, a few of them were high, but really, it wouldn't explain what we were seeing as, as eggs breaking. Why would this be going on? And then, you know, it's like, well, yeah, but they don't just feed on fish. They also feed on the carcasses of dead marine mammals, and they feed on seabirds. So we ended up doing a study looking at the concentrations in these, and this is just to explain to you a little bit how the DD works. It's down here in the sediments, and it either moves up through the water column by diffusion and gets into the water here where it can be picked up by, by fish and organic matter. Also, uh, invertebrates, uh, worms and things like that that are down in, in the sediments come up or are being fed on by fish. The fish are fed on then by gulls, one of the species that the uh, uh, eagles eat, and also fed on to a large degree by, by uh, sea so lions and seals. And the one thing about DDE is it's what we call lipophilic. And that is that it gets stored in fat. And so basically if you eat some, it goes in and some of it is lost, but then some of it is stored in your fat. So if something eats you, it gets everything that you had in your fat. And so if it eats a thousand of you, it gets a thousand of those little packages. And then something eats you, you know, something else, so that some of the peregrines and the bald eagles are eating these things that already have eaten a lot. So when we did our studies, we found out that, that both the gulls and the sea lions had really high concentrations of DDE. And that was the pathway that was getting into the 